It's round three of Norway chess. And in this video, I'm going to show you the game of the day. Maybe it's even the game of the tournament so far. Bragnananda playing with the white pieces against world's number one Magnus Carlsen. And it is going to be extremely exciting. How it is, how it works, well, you will find out within the next 10, 15 minutes or so. Let's just dive straight into the action. But you do have to hit the subscribe button if you want to see more videos. If you do like my analysis of Norway chess and much else, make sure to follow this channel. Thanks for doing that. And then here we go. Pragnananda opens the game with 1e4. And well, he took 30 seconds to, uh, to go for this move. Maybe it's a mind game. Uh, he's playing with Magnus and uh, well, you know, nowadays both players, uh, they play a lot of different openings. So it's very difficult to predict what is going to appear on the board. And here Magnus played the move C5. He's going for the Sicilian and after knight F3, he played the move E6. So that after the moves D4, pawn takes D4, knight takes D4, we have the open Sicilian and Magnus now goes for kind of a uh, strange uh, choice. At least uh, he has played it before. It's the Sicilian Con variation, but it's not very popular at um, at the highest level. It's not a really bad opening, of course. It's uh, perfectly uh, playable, um, but it's not a way to try to play for equality. So if you want to play for equality, you play the Berlin defense or you play another solid uh, opening. But here Magnus already gives a message to his opponent that he just wants to get a fighting type of uh, position. He has played it before, the con variation. Um, but um, in most of his games, after the move bishop d3, he now played the move uh, bishop c5 on all these occasions. In this game against Prague, he goes for the move queen c7. So that after castling, knight f6, queen e2, white is uh, placing the queen on e2 with the idea to prepare the move uh, e5 to, uh, to hit the knight. So black uh, played the move d6. And uh, here we have this so-called uh, hedgehog uh, structure. White is uh, grabbing space with the move uh, c4. And black is uh, having a very solid but somewhat uh, cramped uh, type of uh, position. Here knight bd7 is played. Knight c3. And here knight e5. If you're not familiar with the structures, you're may thinking, why does Magnus uh, go for this uh, move? Well, he does put a bit of pressure against the bishop. And you cannot play in a way that you want to keep the, the bishop pair because also the pawn on c4 will be hanging if you uh, move that uh, bishop. So that that's how it justifies uh, black's uh, play here to, to move for the second time with, um, with the knight. Keeping in mind that still most of his uh, pieces, they are still on their initial square. So white goes for the move h3, kind of a useful move. And um, after the move b6, here f4 is uh, played, so the knight comes under an attack by the pawn. Knight takes d3. That was uh, Magnus' idea. Queen takes d3. And uh, now bishop to b7. So black is aiming to uh, complete his development uh, as soon as possible on the queen side. So he can uh, consider putting a rook on uh, c8. But still, there's also some, um, some concerns here regarding uh, black's king in the center. As he needs still to play the move bishop e7 and castling king side. But Brock doesn't want to wait here at all. He strikes immediately with the move f5, attacking the pawn on uh, e6. So that together with the knight and the pawn, you're trying to force black to make, uh, make a concession. That's of course a clear drawback having place your uh, bishop from c8 to, uh, to b7. The bishop is no longer supporting that, uh, that pawn on e6. So how should black react? Well, the most obvious move here would be to advance the pawn to, uh, to e5. But that is a serious uh, strategical concession. The knight will go back to c2 in that case. And you have a very simple plan here to follow up with bishop g5 and then get your knight to e3. You're ready to trade off your bishop for the knight anytime soon. And then you jump in with the knight to d5 and you're having a great time. Black is completely stuck, lacking counterplay. So the, this clear example why the knights are better than the bishops in such a close uh, position and the hole on, uh, on d5. So instead of making that uh, pawn move e5, Magnus doesn't want to make a concession here yet. Play the move queen d7. So he, um, he defends the pawn with the queen. And well, in general, if you, if you can get away with it, let's say you, you keep your pawns on d6 and e6, you're ready to go bishop e7, castling king side, black is 
kind of uh, solid, but there is a clear drawback to Black's last move, and Prague plays in a very energetic uh, way now. He, first of all, develops the bishop to g5. It's a very logical move, so that here white is about to uh, to open up the f-file with uh, pawn takes e6, and then you're ready to, to take on f6 as, uh, as well. So black goes for the move bishop to, uh, to e7, and now the rook from a1 has been brought into play. Rook a1, excellent move by Prague. And uh, he's trying to put up more pressure against um, the pawn on d6, but also against the queen on uh, d7. Rook c8 played. So uh, the rook is trying to generate some counterplay against the pawn on c4, but that pawn is uh, pretty well defended here, here still. And now one of the key moves in the game, white, moves the queen away from the default. Queen e2 is an excellent idea so that your, your rook on d1 is eyeing the queen on d7. And that means there are some serious issues because, for instance, if you play the most obvious move, castling kingside, that's what you would like to do, yeah? Complete your de development. Then Prague's idea had been for sure here to play the move e5. And the idea is now after d takes e5, you have knight takes e6 with an attack, discovered attack on the queen and the rook on f8. That means white is going to win the exchange for sure. That explains why Magnus didn't castle here, but he realized that this, this idea with the move e5 is a very serious threat, very unpleasant to meet for him. So now, finally, he decides to, uh, to play the move e5 anyway. So that means the file remains closed, the center remains closed. White can no longer break with e5 himself. Bishop takes f6, trading off that uh, knight for the bishop. Black recaptures and, as announced earlier, the knight is going back to c2. That is the best way of playing. So your knight is uh, coming to e3, ready to come to d5 uh, very soon as well. And as I said already, these sort of structures, these bishops, they are not great at all. Unless you're able to activate them as quickly as possible. Well... Let's see how it works. Magnus played a move queen c6, attacking the pawn on uh, c4 with the queen and the rook. Knight to e3, defending the pawn. Bishop to g5. So that's also a thematical idea in a lot of Sicilian structures, trying to get rid of your bad bishop, trading it off for the knight on, uh, on e3. And here, interesting moment. Brock just moved the king. To, uh, to h1. That's a sort of a safe square so that the king will never get into uh, into some sort of a check on, on this diagonal. But there was even a more active way of playing, which I want to point out as actually the most obvious move here to me seems to be knight ed5. Probably he didn't play it because of queen takes c4. But now you're not going for the exchange of queens. You keep queens on the board, you hit the bishop, you will put pressure against the pawn on b6 and indirectly also against the pawn on uh, g7 would have offered white a huge advantage. But instead, king h1 uh, was played. Now at least black does have time now to trade off that poor bishop for the knight. Bishop takes e3, queen takes e3. But the problems are not over here yet because the king still got to uh, try to get out of the center. But if you castle kingside here, for instance, then it's the move f6 with ideas to open up the kingside, probably threat and checkmate. That's something you definitely don't want to face with all these major pieces coming over to the black king very, very soon. So instead of castling, black played the move f6 here himself to prevent white from uh, creating that, uh, that pawn break. White defends the pawn on, um, on c4 and black tries to strike back here with the move b5, attacking the pawn on c4. Of course, you can't take on b5 as the knight on c3 is hanging. That drops a piece, but instead knight comes in to d5. That is an excellent spot for the knight, which also means that the king can't really get out of the center. There are always kind of knight forks on, uh, on e7. Black tried here to move queen c5, offering the exchange of queens. If that happens, Black is out of the woods. That's not a problem for black at all. In general, endgames are very comfortable, but especially this one with a lot of pressure against the white pawns on c4 and, um, and e4. But instead, Prague, trying to play for the initiative, keeps here the queen on the, on the board. Queen f3, excellent move. As I said, 
Castling Kingside, not an option because of Knight E7 winning at least the exchange and maybe even more. So Black decided now to take the pawn on C4. So at least Black does get a pawn, but White is super active and starts here with the move Queen H5 so that the King is uh, forced here to, to stay in the center. King goes to F8. And now another powerful move here by Prague, improving one of his rooks. With the move rook f3, he's trying to gain control over the third rank and especially on the queen side. You may have expected him to try to create a breakthrough on the king side, but it is in fact much easier trying to play on the queen side because that rook on h8 is out of play and cannot easily join play at all because of that king on f8, which disturbs the connection between Black's, uh, Black's rooks. For instance, if you ever take on b3, the rook comes over with an open file and the fact that you're a pawn down, it, it doesn't really matter at all. Instead, Black went here for bishop takes d5. Now it is rook takes d5, attacking the, uh, the uh, queen. And of course you can't take the rook because it's defended by the pawn on, um, on e4. So the queen goes back to uh, to b6 there are other possibilities as uh, well but keeping the pawn on d6 defended seems very very logical but now simple chess just take the pawn on c4 so that you um have never to deal with a potential passed pawn of uh, of black here and look at this queen it cannot become active because if you for instance play queen b1 check the king goes to h2 and you take on e4 it's rook takes d6 and very soon it's rook d7 and there are all sorts of mating threats coming in Therefore, after bc4, rook c4 was played, but now the rook comes over to, uh, to b3. Excellent idea. And note that black has absolutely no chance here for counterplay. If you, for instance, play rook c1, with the idea that if you go here, king h2, the queen can come into g1. That's something you should rather avoid. But you can easily go for the exchange of rooks. If that would happen, you trade off one pair of rooks. And here you see exactly what I meant earlier, that, that rook on h8 is out of play. So black is a pawn up, cannot use that pawn, but also cannot use the rook. So white is practically, practically playing here with an, uh, with an extra rook and able to create very strong threats against uh, the black king uh, very, very soon. Well, something very similar actually happened in the game as they follow the move rook to b4. So trying to um, exchange uh, pieces. But anyway, the rook comes in to d3 so that you're um, defending your uh, your rook on b3 but there's also another very subtle idea which is going to be illustrated uh, very soon because there follows rook takes b3 now after rook takes b3 the queen is once again under threat queen back to c7 and probably magnus was thinking okay give me one or two moves i'm gonna play king e7 get my rook into the game and i may survive this position but Magnus didn't have his best day. He played uh, this move queen c7, but he for sure overlooked White's next uh, move here. Beautiful move. Maybe this is the move of the game. Queen to d1 back. These backward moves, they're always difficult, but the queen needs to work together with the rook. And the main point is that if you now try to play something like king e7 to bring your rook into play, there is this move queen to b1. And there's nothing, but absolutely nothing black can do against the threat of a rook to b7, winning material or launch a devastating attack with the queen and rook. Therefore, instead of king e7, g6 was played, trying to evacuate the king, something uh, like king g7 can be played very soon. But anyway, queen b1 is on the board, rook b7 is still the threat, so that means the king can't come to the seventh rank, queen c5 played, and that is... A tricky last trick by Mr. Carlson because he is hoping here that white falls for this trick with rook check, king g7, queen check, then the king goes away and you can take the rook on h8, which would normally be the winning idea, but there is queen c1, king h2, queen f4, and that uh, means that the queen is able to give a perpetual. So definitely that is something white should not be tempted to, to, to play here. But instead, rook b7, guys, that is the move you're playing for activity, cutting off the king along the seventh rank. And now, even after this, well, black is totally paralyzed, can barely move uh, the king. The rook is still stuck. Pawn takes f5, was played. So the idea is that at some point, maybe the, the rook 
can uh, can join play uh, on the on the G file. And still, there there are some tricky ideas. If you become too active with your queen, let's say queen b3 now, it's still this move queen c1 and then queen f4, which is something you don't really want to work out. Maybe it's still winning, maybe not, I don't know. But anyway, I really like Prague's way of uh, playing because he's not looking for the material. He is playing for mate. But at the same time, he, he needs to realize also that his king can also uh, become victim of a perpetual. So first, he moves the king from h1 to h2. There's all the time in the world to play this move because the pawns in the center, they're absolutely irrelevant. Rook g8 was played. Maybe on a good day, you're able to get the queen in and threaten checkmate yourself. But here it is, queen b3. With mating threat on f7, black goes for the move d5. And now black doesn't have any good check. So it is time to take on h7, opening up the path for the queen to infiltrate. On the back rank queen b8 mate is on the agenda and how to deal with it you can't escape with the king you can't really interfere and uh, otherwise the the queen will very quickly give a check or deliver an, uh, a new mating uh, threat black resigned here absolutely amazing uh, one uh, possible line for instance is this move rook g7 but then queen b8 for uh, for instance and uh, after king f7 to keep the rook defended you give another check on the seventh rank so you're ready to pick up the rook and after queen e7 you can just deflect the king rook takes king takes queen takes e7 winning the queen and the game so that is ramesh babu pragnananda scoring a very very important win in a very impressive style. Let me know, guys, in the comments. What do you think of this game? Maybe this is the game of the tournament. At least a very painful defeat for Magnus in his uh, first uh, tournament, classical tournament of, uh, of this year. Um, anyway, let me know in the comments. What do you think? Give this video a like. Consider making a small donation to my PayPal account. Really appreciate all the support I've been uh, receiving from, um, from you all the uh, last couple of weeks and months. Thanks for that. And stay tuned for more action from Norway Chess. See you soon. Bye-bye.